Um, so welcome everyone once again. My name is Cynthia Walker. I'm the director here at the Brickstore Museum. Um, I want to thank Deb Williams and obviously Bryce Waldrop for being here today uh, and helping us out with our old Your Old House and Other Preservation Stories virtual series, which explores uh, various topics in historic preservation, especially here in Kennebunk and certainly in the wider York County region. Uh, we boast hundreds of historic homes and structures uh, and historic preservation is a constant in our community. Even the museum is housed in five historic buildings, which we are constantly working on to maintain. Um, so the idea for this series came up because of all the knowledgeable professionals that we get to work with. Um, and we thought we'd introduce them to you and, and, and get some help for yourself. So today's episode, How Old Is My House, is a question we get asked almost daily here at the Brickstore Museum. Um, so we're excited to have Bryce here to answer that uh, question. So this virtual series is offer, offered for free, but uh, donations obviously to the Brickstore Museum are always appreciated so we can keep these um, lectures and these series and programs going throughout the year. I just wanna remind you to visit our website's calendar for more programming coming up, uh, which includes a main fiddling uh, music uh, dual mm -hmm. band concert on April 17th. We have two current exhibitions, one on main fiddling and then the other on insignificant, significant buildings in Kenny Bunk, if anybody is interested in that, it's kind of apropos to today. <laughs> um, and a big push we're making this spring is the museum's annual visitor survey. So we really need people to fill that out and tell us what we're doing, if we're doing things good, if we're doing things badly, we'd love to hear from you. Um, last part of my reminders is that the next session in our preservation series is Thursday, April 25th at noon, featuring Cindy Brockway landscape preservationist who will focus on obviously the outdoor history uh, of your own backyard. So you can sign up just as you did for this one, or if you're on Facebook, um, you can go to our website and learn more about that. Uh, as we go through the presentation today, Deb uh, said it at the beginning, but if you have questions as we go along, please type them uh, in the chat or keep them in your mind <laughs> until the end, and then we'll have some time for questions and answers. And now to introduce our speaker today, uh, Bryce Waldrop has been Executive Director of the Historical Society of Wells and Ogunquit since 2020. Prior to joining uh, HSWO, Bryce was a preservation architect for over 20 years, specializing in architectural history. He holds a master's in building conservation and is a certified small museum professional <laughs> and has worked on preservation projects uh, throughout the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic. Bryce resides in uh, York, Maine, and he serves there on the Historic District Commission. Bryce, welcome. Good. Thank you so much. Yeah, and thank you everyone for being here today. Uh, this is I, I, this is a great series uh, that the Brickstore Museum is hosting. Really appreciate that, and I appreciate the invitation uh, to participate. Uh, as Cynthia mentioned, uh, we are surrounded by rich architectural history. Uh, and many of us live in a piece of that history in our old homes. Uh, so the series like this are really great to help uh, help us understand our our places better um, and demystify some things, but also share with you that uh, the tools are there uh, for you to use and to do a lot of DIY to uh, uncover uh, the history and and find those uh, find the expertise uh, you need uh, to better understand your, your home and property. Um, so with that said, uh, why don't we jump right in here? I'm going to share my screen. Let's see. Okay, hopefully everybody can see uh, the slide that says, how old is my house? Uh, again, thank you for for the invitation and very glad that you're all here today. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through uh, what I like to call following the paper trail, uh, researching your old house and property. Um, and before we get into kind of the nuts and bolts of following the paper trail, just wanna talk a little bit about dating houses in general. Uh, when we try to as Cynthia mentioned, and I completely agree, uh, at our at the historical society where I work, we get really two research questions. Uh, one is, 
family history, genealogy, and the other is how old is my house? Uh, all and in those two questions sometimes uh, dovetail really nicely, but it, it is a really common uh, question because we we want to know we we want to either whether it's our family ancestral home or not. I think it's it adds a lot of depth and and meaning to better understand where where we live um, and, and and who lived there before. There, there's such an interesting history um, in all of our homes that uh, can be a lot of a lot of fun at the end of the day to to uncover. Um, so as we get into dating houses, uh, we typically, you know, there are two two different uh, methods or areas we we focus on. One is the physical side, the style, the features, and any physical changes that the house has gone through. And the other piece is the research, the paper trail. That's what we're going to focus on today. Um, and it's best when you kind of combine these two uh, approaches together. Uh, they really uh, talk to each other quite a bit. Um, so regarding the physical features side, there are some things you can do um, to, to sort of brush up on architectural styles and changes in your community. Um, like taking walking tours. I know the Brick Store Museum offers a really beautiful uh, walking tour, architectural walking tour. Um, you can watch video lectures online. There's plenty of content online. And your local societies like Brick Store has, has a lot of excellent digital resources. Um, Historical Society of Wells and Agunquit, we have a video archive with some architectural style history lectures. Um, and then, of course, looking at uh, architectural guidebooks, um, you know, any of these sources can really help you look at your house and, and you can learn so much just by looking at the house itself. And we'll talk a little bit about that as we go through. Um, and then just about, yeah, house dates. Uh, sometimes we will see uh, what we call a circa date. The house is circa 1810. Uh, that means it's generally plus or minus 10 years. Uh, sometimes that's as close as we can get and, and that's okay. You know, that's 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 pretty good. Um, I like to say that with the style of the house, you can usually get within 10 years of a house. If, um, of course, it may have changed and we'll talk about that too. So again, original shape or style, uh, it may have changed. You might have a beautiful Greek revival home uh, and hiding underneath is an 18th century cape. Um, Happens all the time. <laughs> um, we're going to look at deeds. And so if you have a deed to your property, um, and we'll talk a little bit about this, more about this, but the date on the deed that that property was sold or, or parceled out may or may not be the date of the structures on that, on that property. So that's something to, to be aware of. Um, and then date stones or plaques, uh, on a house uh, may or may not be correct. Sometimes they are, and that's great. And sometimes uh, they they might not be. So it's good information to note, but also you know want to always double check everything. <laughs> um, so where do we start? So start with your local historical society. And I know I'm I'm biased, <laughs> um, but but for seriously, uh, your local uh, historical societies. Uh, are really your your best local resource uh, on on community history and on the history of, of the town or where you live. Um, talk to the staff, uh, talk to the volunteers, um, and and there's a very it's very possible that someone else has has done research either on your property or one nearby or or on the neighborhood in general. So you can. Uh, build on other research that's been done that could save you a lot of time and, and add a lot a lot to your your own project uh, towns often conduct architectural surveys uh, these are methodical surveys of a, a either a town in whole or in part to us uh, to study its architectural styles and development um, and these survey files uh, will often have a little bit of information on each of the properties so always good to check that too. That could be a good starting point. Uh, and then look at your town and community histories. Uh, 
They might talk about the family that lived on your property, or they might talk about your neighborhood in general. So you can understand how how that area grew or developed, and and that can really help you understand uh, where your your house and your property fit into into the story. Uh, and then talk to your neighbors uh, and and the previous owners, if possible. Um, ask them about the property. Uh, do they have any old photos or did they find anything in the attic, you know, when they were cleaning out that that kind of thing? Uh, you, you never know, <laughs> right? Uh, part of research is, is serendipitous. So, um, yeah, it's always good to, to ask around. <clears throat> so for following the paper trail, uh, we're going to talk about uh, six different sources today. Uh, you can see listed here deeds, uh, then graphic records like maps uh, and photographs, and then other data like tax data, census records, and probate data, wills, and, and inventories. And each of these will give us a different kind of information that taken together, hopefully we can begin to zoom in on, on how old our house might be. <clears throat> so starting with deeds, uh, they in York County, uh, the deeds are located at the county courthouse in Alfred. Uh, very accessible, very uh, navigable. Uh, the staff there is great. Um, even if you're just starting out, they're happy to answer questions and get you started and show you how the process works. And uh, you can also search a lot of these online now. If you go to the county registrar, uh, the Registry of Deeds website, uh, you can sign up to search records online. Uh, so you can often read a lot of them online. And even if they aren't digitized, sometimes you can email them and for a small fee, they will print them out or uh, scan them for you. So you, there's quite a bit you can do from home um, on, on your research. Uh, and deeds in, are really your best source for a a house or a property's ownership history. Uh, it's it's a legal record. Uh, it has a lot of very specific information. And as we'll see, uh, the, the format and content of deeds really, really hasn't changed in, in a, probably 400 years. So uh, it's consistent typically and uh, has a lot of good information. Um, regarding structures, houses, barns, buildings on a property, on a deed, sometimes deeds are really about the property itself, the boundaries, the acreage. Um, and if they talk about buildings, it, it's it's usually pretty general. They might just say these five acres and the buildings thereon standing. Um, it could be that general. Sometimes they, they might say a house and barn, um, but, um, so that you might not get you know specific information uh, about the house or from the deed, but sometimes you can start to bracket like okay, when they sold the property in eighteen hundred, it didn't meant it just mentioned a farm field, no no structures, and then in eighteen twenty it mentioned the buildings thereon. So there's a chance uh, those buildings appeared in those twenty years. <clears throat> So yeah, again, this is a deeds are records of real property transfer and ownership. Uh, we'll always talk about a unique piece of land. Um, it will always mention the buyer and the seller. Uh, and also, we want to keep in mind that we'll talk about property boundaries. Um, early deeds often would refer to uh, landmarks that are no longer there. Uh, a, a tall pine tree that was marked on four sides. Uh, or even a, a stone wall or an orchard or something that may or may not still be there. Um, so that can be a little challenging, um, but there's there's ways to other other information to use. Um, so here's a typical deed. Uh, this one's from about 1840, 47, 48. Uh, but again, the, the content and the, the format of deeds really hasn't changed a whole lot. So what, once you get into it and start reading a few of them, you, you really start to pick up on the on the format and the flow. Um, 
but every deed uh, should have a, a book and page number. And those, and I should say too, when you're doing any time you're doing research, take lots of notes. Um, so you can obviously, so you can find these, these resources again, uh, but especially true with deeds. And I actually use a, a spreadsheet table that I fill out. Um, so you wanna note the book and page number uh, that that deed, uh, where that where that sits. And the deed will start out with the buyer, I'm sorry, the seller and the buyer called the grantor and the grantee. And there are indexes when you're researching a property. Um, if you, there's a grantor index and a grantee index, which is really helpful. You might know who sold the property uh, so you can look under their name, or you might know who bought it. And so you can look under their name to see when they bought it. So, um, and those index separate indexes are at the courthouse as well. Uh, then it's followed by the property description. And the property description will typically talk about the size, the location, and possibly structures. Uh, it will tell you exactly the, the acreage of the property, the boundaries, uh, the meets and bounds uh, that we call meets and bounds. That'll be this many feet or rods or chains in this azimuth. Uh, so, and we'll look at that in a second um, in more detail. Uh, then it'll conclude with the date of the deed. And very, very important, uh, it will often tell you the previous book and page number of the previous deed. Uh, and that's critical. Uh, so in a perfect world, uh, you can start with your current deed today that you, if you, even if you bought your property last year, you can look at your deed and it should tell you the previous book and page number for the previous deed. And if it works the way the system should, uh, you can trace, follow that back all the way back to the 1600s. Um, Sometimes there are gaps and we'll talk about that. Uh, um, but anyway, that's that's how a deed is structured and that's the information you're looking for. <clears throat> so let's talk about the boundaries um, and how, how this can help us understand. Uh, Cause again, we're, we're trying to date our house uh, but it's really also about the property itself um, and understanding how that property may have changed and that can, also give us clues to the, the house itself. Uh, so whenever I'm starting to look at a property and research it, I always pull up the current, uh, I pull up like a, a Google aerial view. Uh, you can see on the left, uh, try to get a feel for what it looks like today. What's the, the landscape like? Um, landscape has changed <laughs> obviously quite a bit. Uh, Maine was, heavily forested until the, the 16 and 1700s. By 1800, it was most of where we live now was uh, deforested and has now been, uh, we have new growth. Uh, so landscape changes, but you can you can start to get a feel for the shape and, and, and the layout of the area. I also pull up the current tax map, which you can see on the right for this property. And in this case, I, on the left, I see this open field, and on the tax map, I can trace uh, the property that probably comprised that field originally, and, and it does. Um, and where the arrow is pointing, we're going to talk about this corner lot right here. So this corner lot, <clears throat> um, the, the deed for the field goes back into the 1700s. And it was uh, a six acre field um, used for tillage agriculture. Um, and then in 1847, the, um, the, the father who owned the property parceled out a piece of that land and sold it to his son. And that's this corner lot. It's about a half of an acre. And I mentioned the meets and bounds. so. In the deed, it will tell you, it, it will give you the, the geometry uh, and orientation of your property. So in this case, we've got 
uh, a relatively square property, eight rods by 12 rods. And so we can draw that. You can literally orient it on your paper or on a map um, and, and fit it into the property. And so we can see tracing over this aerial view, we can see roughly the size of, of what that included. And it included a house and a barn, uh, both of which are still standing today. But at some point, uh, don't remember the exact date off the top of my head, I think it was early 20th century, but um, that property shape changed. They, the property changed hands and they reshaped it in, into the configuration you see here, uh, removing the barn from the property. Uh, about the same amount of acreage. Um, and I, I think this had to do with uh, moving away from agriculture per se and more to, uh, you know, just more of a, just a residential uh, property. Um, but this is just an example of when you're going through your deeds, you want to pay close attention to uh, the size of the property, um, its, its boundaries and orientation, uh, because they they might change. Um, most often, uh, properties will most often get smaller. Uh, historically, you might have a large farm of, let's say it's a hundred acre farm, but over time that gets divided up for children who need land and property. Um, so in any case, property boundaries, shape sizes do change. <clears throat> and actually this, if we go back, this shape um, also matches, you can see, the, the current tax parcel. So again, your tax maps are great um, because there, there's a lot of history there. Um, and you can often, it, it can help you uh, confirm and build confidence. Okay, yes, I'm, I'm on the right track because that seems to fit. Um, if it's completely out of whack, then maybe it changed somewhere, or maybe something's a little off. <clears throat> oh, and just for curiosity, um, deeds refer to uh, the measurement systems are typic are not in feet and inches. Uh, it's typically chains, links, and rods. Uh, a chain is 66 feet, um, which is 100 links or four rods. Um, a rod, sometimes called a pole or a perch, is about 16 and a half feet. Um, and you can see on the right here, that's actually an original surveyor's chain, um, a 66 foot chain. And uh, so they literally were a chain. Uh, and that, that 66 foot dimension comes from English uh, land development from, from England and carried over to, to, uh, to America. <clears throat> so that's a little bit about deeds. So we've identified where our property is, roughly how big it is, maybe if it's changed, um, maybe there's a building mentioned, maybe there isn't. Um, and so now we're starting to kind of, we, we've created a, a context. Uh, now let's talk about graphic records. Um, and this, these are the I mean, it's all fun, but who doesn't love maps and photographs, right? I mean, this is, uh, there, there's so much information to work with and they're just fun to look at. Um, so maps um, sometimes can show houses, uh, can even show houses, property and, and their shape, um, can show the owner's names and you can start to circa date your house when you look at maps. So. It's not on the 1856 map, but the house is on the 1872 map. So it appeared in the intervening 16 years. Um, some maps are more accurate than others. <clears throat> this map uh, is a detail of the property I just showed you. Um, and this triangular piece is actually a 90 degree angle in real life. So some maps, um, you have to you have to just keep that in mind um, that uh, they may have not be completely geometrically accurate. Um, 
So a couple of map, a few maps that will be helpful uh, in York County uh, and in the surrounding areas. Uh, in York, you've got the 1794 Sewell survey. Um, you have the 1794 Wheelwright survey for wells, uh, which would have included Kennebunk um, at the time uh, up till 1820. Then you've got the 1856 and 1872 maps uh, atlas, atlas for York County, uh, which are really fantastic. Uh, these cover all the towns in the county. Um, they're available online as well as at your local historical societies, uh, and they have a lot of information. Then you've got USGS maps. These are your uh, topographic maps uh, and then railroad surveys. Uh, there's always a chance, and this is what's great about going to the historical society. You, you can talk to folks there, uh, and there may be 10 other maps that I haven't mentioned. Um, you know, the uh, the beaches in, in our towns often got developed uh, in the late 1800s, early 20th century, uh, got developed sometimes on mass. So you might have this whole development plan showing all the properties and, and structures. Uh, so things like that can happen. Um, maybe uh, and railroad surveys. The railroads came in 1840s. Um, again, after the Civil War, uh, railroads did very detailed uh, surveys of their their routes, and they had to do a lot of uh, buying and selling of properties. So they often have accurate uh, depictions of the adjoining properties to the railroad uh, right of way. Uh, so those can be really helpful. And you can find these sources, of course, at the uh, Historical Society. Uh, your water district often has quite a few, few maps and resources. County Courthouse, and of course, online at the, the Maine State Archives. So this is uh, the 1856 map of York County. Um, and on the right is a, just a detail showing Kennebunkport and Kennebunk. And you can see you've got a lot of information. You have the road networks, you have some uh, topographical features, the railroads, the rivers, and you have uh, buildings, not just homes, but commercial structures, schoolhouses, public buildings, churches. And the houses all, uh, for the most part, have names with them, often a first initial and a last name. <clears throat> and then, 1872, uh, you get 1872 maps, uh, much more detail, uh, tend to be a little more accurate in, in the in the routes and the layout. Um, and in the sort of outer parts of your town, you might have, you know, a, a dot on the map with that first initial and last name, uh, which is great. That could be just what you're looking you know, it's enough of what you need. Uh, but they also have, sometimes they have detail sections. So on the right, we're looking at uh, downtown Kennebunk. Uh, this is a detail section of the 1872 map, which shows you an incredible amount of detail. We're actually seeing the shape outlines of properties themselves. Uh, we're seeing names uh, sometimes. So in this case, Mrs. J. Uh, Mrs. D. Uh, Stewart. So you get a little more information. You can see the shape of the buildings. You can, which is usually pretty accurate on this map. Um, so you might say, oh, look, they added on an addition on the back of the house. So that, that can start to tell us when that happened. Um, yeah, so lots, lots of great information to, to draw from. <clears throat> So here are some other details, uh, wells and the gunquit. <clears throat> Again, you're, you're getting, you know, shapes of properties, uh, names. You might get you know, Captain Samuel Lindsay. So you, again, you're getting more information, um, which can be very helpful because sometimes the first initial is not enough. <laughs> So another type of map is are called Sanborn 
Sanborn maps. Uh, these were fire insurance maps that came out uh, that began uh, privately created fire insurance maps started in the mid 1800s, uh, continued into the to well into the 20th century. And this was really for insurance companies to assess the risk of property insurance, uh, which means you get a lot of information. So in this case, um, you're seeing your the street, the address, the, the shape of the property. Um, and there's a key in the beginning, which will tell you what all of these colors and all these codes mean. So this property here shows it has a wraparound porch. It's two stories. It's painted. It's colored yellow, so it's a wood frame structure. A uh, lot of information to to work with. And if you look closely, uh, so right here on the on the right map, you can see they've cut and pasted a piece on it. These maps were often updated regularly um, as properties changed, which is really interesting. So sometimes you can actually find Sanborn maps for the same place from different time periods, and it will tell you kind of how, how properties changed. So these are great. <clears throat> then you have the survey topographic maps. Uh, topographic maps are really helpful. They're very detailed. They're done by the Corps of Engineers. Um, incredibly accurate. Uh, they show accurate topography, um, distances, infrastructure, and landscape. They tend to be a little more high level uh, and, and very general about the structures that are there, but you can still find a dot, which might be your house. Um, but mostly you can get a really accurate view of, of the landscape. <clears throat> so let's talk about photographs. I just wanna be mindful of time here. So. Uh, we still have a few things to get through, but um, so photographs are great. They really do say a thousand words. Um, and the question is always, uh, when you find that great old photo, does it have a date on it? Does it have a name on it? Um, we all know, those of us who work with archives, um, there's nothing more frustrating than that beautiful old photograph that uh, <laughs> doesn't have the person's name on it or location. Um, but you can do a lot with the photos. So. Uh, this is a photo of the house, uh, the property I mentioned before. Um, and you can date photos uh, often by the technology or the clothing people are wearing, the vehicles you see, uh, or landmarks or features that may have changed. And look at what a neighboring photographs. So if you're researching a property, look at the surrounding area see if there are photographs of other properties. So this is down the hill from that house I just showed you, looking back up so we can see parts of that property uh, here. In this case, if you're researching this house, uh, we have two different views from down the hill that show that property. So again, you might you might get lucky. And, uh, and if you live anywhere near landmark structures like a church or a school or anything like that, uh, those can be, those can often pick up uh, background as well. Postcards, um, there's no shortage of postcards uh, in the seacoast of Maine, uh, which are fantastic and, and uh, also just a treasure and fun, fun to look at, um, but also great records of, of how, uh, properties have changed. Um, photographic uh, postcards started in the in the 1800s, mid 1800s, and continue well into the 20th century. So you can really get a great uh, evolution of, of your, your area. So let's uh, quick uh, tax records. Um, so tax records can be really helpful in understanding how a property and its structures uh, have changed. Um, they will tell you um, what the person owned, both real and personal property. Um, typically, they're found at your local town hall, um, but sometimes the older records have been uh, deposited with your historical society. Uh, that's the case in Wells. Um, in York, uh, you could actually research the tax records right in the town hall. Um, 
Uh, so it just depends on on your town. Um, and so these these can be really valuable. So in this case, um, looking at this property on the right, this is the property I showed you earlier. We see Joseph Playstead Jr. Um, this is 1848. In 1847, Joseph Playstead Jr., uh, who purchased that parcel from his father in 1847, the previous year he was taxed on just owning one horse. Uh, the next year he's taxed on a house at $125 and three quarters of an acre of land for $50. So this gives us a pretty good idea that he bought the house in eight, or the property in 1847 and within a year a house appeared. That's pretty good. Uh, and we combine that with um, the deed which showed when he bought the property. <clears throat> um, and I actually have to say the deed for his property, um, it, it's actually, it was 1848. And he, it says the property upon which my son Joseph recently erected a house. Um, I mean, I kind of, feel, that's almost like cheating, right? I mean, it's that that's pretty rare, uh, but it was really exciting because we were really able to pin down uh, this house to, to 1848. And looking at the photograph of it uh, on the right, um, this photo is from about 1890, um, but that the style of the house uh, fits right into 1848. It's a Greek revival. Uh, it's called a raised cape. It's a little taller, more upright than your typical cape. Fits right into uh, the time period of the 1840s uh, in, in Maine. So again, we're starting to see how all these pieces start to overlap and, and help us zoom in on, on how old the property might be. So census records, uh, if you've done any kind of family research, um, any local history research, you've probably worked with census records. Uh, the federal census began in 1790. It's continued every 10 years since. Um, they are published publicly when the record is 72 years old. So in 2022, we finally got a look at the 1950 census. Uh, it gives you a lot of information. The owner of the property will often say uh, the head of household, um, the occupants of the property, everyone who's, who's residing there, even if they're not family, um, and your neighbors, of course, you get to see who lived on either side. Um, and you can see when you might see when a neighbor or a resident appears or moves away. Um, and census takers typically went door to door through a neighborhood. Um, some of the early records are alphabetical, which is not super helpful for property research as much. Um, but as of 1840 and really 1850 on, Everyone's listed um, very methodically. They have a, a standard format that they used. So you get a lot more information and it's more uh, methodical. So this is 1790 uh, census. Again, you're seeing um, there, there's an incredible amount of social information here. Um, and we do get to see the property owner's name. So we know they owned property in the town at that time. We get to see how many people, male, female, um, white persons, other than white persons, sometimes listing slaves, even in Maine. Um, so a lot of, lot of information there. Uh, but again, by 1850, this gets much more standardized. As you can see here, we, we see the, it uh, starts with the head of household, um, which was often a man, but not always. Uh, women did own property. Um, or may have been widowed and, and willed the property. And we'll talk about that too. But here we see everyone who lives there, their ages and their occupations. That can be really helpful. This person is a farmer. So that can affect how we look at that property and understand how that property was operating and used. Um, and then you get to see the neighbors on either side. This is where you can combine this, the 1850, census, let's say, with that 1856 map and say, okay, I'm looking for a Jay Moulton who has these people on either side. And that you fit that on the map and then chances are you might have found, found your property and, and you can feel more confident about it. 
Uh, there's also um, agricultural schedules that that happen at certain times, and these are great too because you can uh, not only was John Moulton a farmer, but you can see what types of produce and and products he was he was farming uh, and producing and and likely selling. <coughs> So let's talk a little bit about probate records. Um, these are your wills, inventories, letters of administration, um, very valuable. They're also located at the county courthouse uh, in Alfred, uh, very well-preserved, very um, navigable, very, I won't say easy, but you, you can get to the information and get your hands on it. Um, and, and it, you know, and. It, it's um and it's very exciting because there's so much to work with. So <clears throat> probate records we'll talk about um, often discuss in detail the homes, the properties, who sometimes who lived in what part of a house. Um, and then if a property, if someone died intestate or without a will, they would often do an inventory upon their death. And these are really fantastic because they bring in three people. Uh, I think it's a close relation, a neighbor, and then a more objective person uh, to inventory all the contents of the house and the property. So you get this long list of everything this person owned at a particular time. Uh, it's just an incredible, view. it can be a really amazing view of uh, how a house was laid out. Um, Sometimes they will tell you room by room in the parlor. Here's the furniture and items that were in the parlor in the kitchen. Here's what was in there. So you can really paint a beautiful picture of your house. Um, and in this case, uh, that property I mentioned from 1848, uh, there was a will, um, not an inventory because they actually had a will. But in the will, it talks about all the family members and and this is this is pretty typical for wills, um, uh, especially the male owner of the property would want to provide for uh, maybe <laughs> sometimes not uh, provide for his his spouse and their children or other relations. And in this case, the will specifies his, his wife, uh, his widow will have access to a certain side of the house. And they actually draw a line from the back fence through the dooryard into the hallway and through the house, they draw kind of a map and detailing who gets what parts of the house. So now we can actually pretty much draw a map of this house, which is really incredible. Um, and on the social side, you can, you can learn a lot about families, how they worked, maybe some dysfunction or some, some challenges they might have had. Um, and that can tell you a lot about a house, too. Um, if your house has been divided up, you know, and you're trying to figure out why, maybe there was a, a family reason for that. <clears throat> and sometimes uh, with with probate records, you might get might get lucky and get a map or a survey uh, because they really wanted to detail very carefully uh, how a property was getting divided up. And in this case, um, you have a property uh, that's being divided up um, to the to the heirs. And in the top here, it's a little hard to read, but this property was divided into three sections. And this is called the ancient widow's thirds. So uh, a widow uh, would often be afforded at a minimum a, a third of the estate. Um, so. In this case, again, you're getting a lot of information. We see a house, uh, we see a barn, we see the road layout, we see adjoining property owners. Um, really just you know, great, great information. So inventories, as I mentioned, typically completed uh, when there's no will. Um, And so here's an example of an inventory. This is from 1746. Um, so, and this goes through very detailed, 38 acres of land and buildings thereon, um, four shares in the common lands, 
a lot of meadowland in the commons, hay in the barn, and uh, scythe and tackling. So the other thing it mentions, let's see if I have it here. Um, oh, here, a bedstead, bedding, a hay fork. Um, so they, they really, they inventory and itemize everything. Um, there's another section of this will that uh, talks about Turner's tools. So this was Joseph Sedgley, and he was uh, a Turner, a wood Turner. And so this confirms that he, he had those tools. So we, we can say, you know, he was one of the early Turners uh, in, in the town. Um, again, you learn a lot about a person, their occupation and, and how they how they use their property. So this is the paper trail, but of course, lots of digital resources out there. Um, see if your local historical society has online resources. I know Brickstore Museum does, a number of the regional societies. Uh, we're, we're starting to move our records online uh, as much as we can. Um, Wells Historical, we have uh, our, our database is now available online. So it can be a great place to start um, doing your research. And it, it's helpful too, because you can start to map out what you want to do, uh, things you want to see when you do get that that time to get to the historical society. Um, and then <clears throat> I mentioned York County Deeds can be searched online. Um, Maine State Archives has a great website, which also has a searchable database. Um, you can find a lot of information, especially the early maps. Um, and then and you might find photographs of your area. You, you just never know. Uh, the main memory network is run through the, excuse me, the main historical society uh, in Portland. And that's a great online tool. And it's it's a, a collaboration of, it, it's really sort of an online repository where any main institutions can, can share uh, photos, maps, historic, re digitized resources. So that can be a great, uh, great place to start as well. So we're kind of coming to the end here. Um, again, we've talked about the, these different uh, tools and sources that you can begin to put the picture together of, of the story of your house. Um, Mary and Moody is here to remind us, don't forget about genealogy. Um, I haven't focused a lot on it right now, but the, the genealogy of the family, which you're inevitably going to uncover as you go, uh, can be really helpful. So if you're researching your property belonged to the Smith family in the 1850s, see if there's a genealogy uh, or any genealogical records that have been put together of that family um, and those people. Research the people. They're there could be a diary of daily life on that property um, or an old family story that talks about when the barn burned and they built a new one. Uh, anything like that can be can be really helpful. <clears throat> so I hope I haven't talked too fast, <laughs> but I want to leave some time for questions. Um, so I will, uh, I guess I'll, I'll leave this up there for now and uh, open it up to any questions. Bryce, Jay, Jay Smith, can you hear me? Oh, yes, I can. Hi, Jay. Hi, greetings. Um, I'm very familiar with utilizing the uh, on online services of the Registrar of Deeds uh, in Alfred to get copies of deeds, but I wasn't sure or comfortable on how to gain access to the probate documents, wills and the, and the like. Um, is it a different website? Uh, do, how would I gain access to wills? Okay, good, good question. I'm not sure the will, the probate records are available online. Um, yeah, so those you might have to go there in person. Um, and it's, it's actually a different, office. Uh, the Office of the Registry of Deeds handles the deeds uh, and the probate office, which is upstairs above the, regist the Registry of Deeds, uh, handles the probate records. And when you get there, um, and again, they can help get you started and show you how to use the catalog and, and 
in the in the index, um, and it is in some cases a, a card catalog, <laughs> um, which some of us are old enough to remember. But um, so, but they can get you started, and there's a there'll be a docket number, which is the sort of the location number of of that probate record, uh, and you'll write down the docket numbers and and the names. And then you'll have to go all the way down to the basement where there's this room full of binders, full of all the original uh, handwritten probate records, which is pretty awesome. But uh, so it it's just uh, very similar to the, the deed process, um, just a different department. Okay, thanks. It sounds like a little more work. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, so friends, this is Cynthia um, Walker. I'm just just reminding you if you do have a question, and Bryce timed this perfectly, so we have about five minutes left. Uh, <laughs> but if you have a question again, like Jay, you're welcome to unmute, or you can certainly type it in the um, in the chat, and I I will happily read it uh, aloud. But as we're waiting for the last few. Um, questions to come in Bryce I was we recently uh were talking with someone here at the museum that um has a house that essentially was put together using different pieces of uh houses along a, a street and the, they were mm -hmm. essentially moved from one site and pushed together into a, a different house um have you ever come upon something like that and then how what what has been the adventure in trying to figure out how to date something like that? <laughs> that that's a great question, and I'm glad you brought that up because uh, people are often surprised that buildings were moved as much as they were, but they were they were from the 1600s on. Uh, buildings were very valuable. It took a lot of resources to build a house, build a barn, uh, and People would often take them with them or or relocate them, move them on the property or to a different property. Um, the uh, the theater in a gun, in, I'm sorry, on Nantucket was floated across the bay twice. Um, so it, it happened a lot. Um, and so putting together that story, it can be tricky. Um, and in that case, that's really where the physical investigation is is really helpful. Um, getting into, um, and this is a whole other talk that maybe we can do sometime, but uh, walking through the house and looking for those clues and those details on what changed and, and what happened. Um, and there are actually construction uh, details you can look at to say, oh, this structure was, was mated to this one. They weren't built as one. Um, so there's a lot you can do forensically to start to piece that together. Um, but in terms of where did those pieces come from? When did they get moved? Uh, some of the maps could be helpful if you see a structure appear or a structure gets larger. Um, photographs, if you're lucky enough, a uh, photograph, of course. Um, but if you're going back into the 17. 1600s, 1600s gets a little trickier. Um, wills uh, and inventories can be helpful. Um, that 1740s will, I, I mentioned the inventory. Um, it divided the barn into thirds oh. among the, the children. And, but when we looked at the structure of the barn, it, it was six bays, which is divisible by three but mm -hmm. it was originally five bays and that sixth bay was added. Oh. Um, and you can see that in the construction. So that tells us, okay, by 1740, they had already expanded it to six bays because that's divisible by three. So, you know, there's, <laughs> it, this is where you're really getting into, you know, you're becoming, um, Anola Holmes, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> right. you know, and, and, getting into the details, which is really the fun part, um, but it could be frustrating, I get. Um, sure. But the only thing constant is change and very likely your house has changed over time. Um, 
and understanding uh, architectural typical styles, um, a bit about methods of construction uh, can help you start to put that together. Um, yeah. I like it. Thank you. <laughs> um, and I like the proposal of perhaps a forensic analysis of, of uh, a structure, which sounds really exciting. So maybe we will think about that in the future. <laughs> uh, as we close out, we have just one question from Paul, which um, I, I think I have an answer for this if you don't, but he, he essentially said he couldn't write fast enough. So he's wondering if your outline <laughs> is available. <laughs> Uh, to which I will say, uh, obviously, we're recording this. So um, if you don't yeah. have an outline, then we are certainly sending this out for everybody to to watch at their leisure and and take enough notes. <laughs> Great. And then, yeah, of course, and, yeah. I'll remind, sorry, everybody, that Bryce has put his um, contact information right up on the last slide if, you, if you'd like to get in contact personally. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Please reach out with any questions. Happy to help. Um, if you want to send me some photos to look at of your house, uh, love seeing pictures of old houses and helping offer whatever, uh, you know, clues I can, uh, happy to do that. So yeah, reach out anytime. Thank you, Bryce. And I want to thank everyone uh, who joined us today on our um, second preservation session. Hopefully you enjoyed and learned a little bit more about uh, all the work that goes into historic homes. Um, and again, next month is uh, April, yeah, April 25th. We're going to learn a little bit more about um, landscapes and, and his out, outside the home uh, historically. Uh, and again, get in touch with the museum or Bryce uh, if you have any more questions uh, on your own house. Anyway, we will see you next time. Thank you, Bryce. <laughs> Thank you so much. Take care.